All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Richard van Duinen. I'm from. Um, it's, it's okay like this. Yeah. Um, yeah, from Germany, and I'll be talking a bit about um, how nutrients uh, added, so either nitrogen or phosphorus, and the timing of this uh, nutrient affects the root system architecture of uh, Hordeum vulgare. Now, first of all, um, we know from common knowledge from agricultural practice that you can add phosphorus as a later stage of cropping, especially in medium to high phosphorus soils, um, without having a decrease in yield, but nitrogen you really need from the start if you want to achieve a high yield. And interestingly, while um, this is kind of common knowledge, we find uh, very few studies that explicitly test uh, the timing effect um, of adding nutrients, especially focusing on multiple nutrients at the same time. And this experiment I did is part um, of a research consortium, consortium which is called um, Implamint, which is again part of Bonares, it's a German funded project um, for how do we make uh, our soils more sustainable or agriculture practice more sustainable, focusing on the soils. And um, the title is Implamint stands for Increasing Agricultural Nutrient Use Efficiency by Optimizing Plant Soil Microorganism Interactions. And the central hypothesis of the whole uh, project is that engin engineering the soil microbial community um, by targeting f uh, fertilizer and soil amendment application <coughs> schemes is the key to improving this uh, nutrient efficiency in crop production. And we've got a whole bunch of different uh, universities working here together. And I'll be working mostly on the, the plant part and the fertilizer part. So. When we think about nutrient deficiency and plasticity in roots, um, we see some general root system architecture adaptations. Uh, for example, in low nitrogen soils, we can see steeper and deeper root systems, whereas um, in low phosphorus soils, uh, we can see generally a higher root density in the topsoils. And in addition to that, spatial heterogeneity is also studied quite well. If we see a nutrient patch, um, we can see a root proliferation there. So the root length density increases in these patches to take up all the nutrients. However, if we go back to this timing part, well, why has it not been done so much, especially in soil? Because you cannot see the roots. And um, yeah, to, um, to study the roots anyway, we use this thing called riser boxes. You already saw them in the last presentations, where you can track the roots over time non-invasively. And we asked um, the following overall question in this experiment. So how does spring barley, which is our crop model plant, um, how does it respond to timing um, of addition of either nitrogen or phosphorus? And we have a couple of general hypotheses that um, if we apply nitrogen later, we see an increase in root length and also an increase uh, root biomass investment in lower depths. Um, on the other hand, if we add phosphorus late, we can also could see an increase in root length, but we would see a higher root biomass investment in the topsoil. And the timing part of this is that these responses would increase the later the nutrient is added. So we grew them, uh, we grew, like I said, uh, spring barley, hordeum vulgare. We grew them in a greenhouse in these riser boxes and they were filled with um, a very poor soil, so a mixture of uh, sand, lus, and peat. And this resulted, yeah, a very low nutrient base soil where we could work with. And then we added the nutrients in the form uh, of Hoakland. And this Hoakland, we could take out the nitrogen, uh, we could take out the phosphorus, we could take out both or none. And then we could add the complete lacking nitrogen uh, or phosphorus after two, three or four weeks. So just to clarify the abbreviations I will use throughout this talk is um, we have a control group which received Hoakland all the time, so they received um, nitrogen and phosphorus all the time. Then we had kind of like a false control uh, where we added both nitrogen and phosphorus after three weeks. And this was to see if one nutrient was more limiting. Then after that we um, added either phosphorus or nitrogen after two, three or four weeks. Uh, so it means that if you see N to W, it means the nitrogen was initially lacking and it was added later. Then we measured this uh, visible root length in these riser boxes. Mm, we took photographs uh, three times per week using this photo box with a, with a holder and a camera. 
And using these photographs, we could then draw the route using smart route, and then we could uh, extract the data and work with it. So let's have a look at uh, the data. First of all, over here you see um, the control group and the ones that uh, lack phosphorus initially. So this is kind of hard to see, but I'll try. Um, over here you have so the time on the x-axis and you have the visible root length on the y-axis. And what we see here initially is that so the P2W, so the, the phosphorus added two weeks later, follows kind of the same pattern um, as, the, as the control group. But we see kind of a divergence going later if we add phosphorus after three or four weeks. So they have a decreased root length. However, if you look, if we add nitrogen later, first of all, you see a completely different picture. So we see um, the overall root length is much lower. So the plants, they're also doing worse. We see that the, the F treatment, which had no N, no P for three weeks, kind of follows the same pattern. So nitrogen was the main limiting factor. However, the interesting part here is that we see after four weeks, uh, we see an increase. The plants that didn't get nitrogen yet, they show an increase in root length starting from around here. But when they receive nitrogen, um, the, yeah, the root length didn't increase as much, so they invest, stopped investing in roots. And then at the end of the experiment, they basically had all the same root length. Another part I want to emphasize here is so the initial uh, visible root length of the experiment. So until day 15, the plants received no nitrogen or no phosphorus in these specific treatments. So if we zoom a bit in on these two points, um, we see also a very clear pattern that here you have um, the no the no nitrogen plants, also the no nitrogen and no phosphorus plants, here the control and the phosphorus lacking plants. And we see initially the roots respond by increasing their visible root length, which is mostly the seminal roots at the start. However, after around roughly day 10, um, the control plants and the p lacking plants, they kind of overtake, they have a high increase visible root length. So this shows that there is an initial response of nitrogen but uh, when the plants are so deficient, um, the root length doesn't increase as much. Then we have a look at uh, the, the harvest data. So at the, at the end of the experiment, uh, we see here the, the shoot biomass, um, the root biomass, again here the treatment, so the control, we add phosphorus later or we add nitrogen later. And the first pattern we see here is actually that the, the shoot to root ratio is similar for all treatment which is kind of interesting by itself. So we actually, we don't see a high in, uh, investment in the, in the root biomass. And the second part you can see from this graph is that we don't see a reduction if we add phosphorus after two weeks, but we do see a reduction in shoot and root biomass if we add phosphorus after three or four weeks. The next point is if we look at nitrogen again is that we see a decrease no matter what. So if you add nitrogen already after two <coughs> weeks, we see a significant decrease in the biomass. But then again, if you add it after three, four, um, three or four weeks, it doesn't actually matter that much in terms of biomass production. Although there's a slight, uh, a slight trend here that it's going down. Then we go back to the, the visible root length data. So it's kind of important. Uh, we see just a part of the root system so we have to know, okay, how much of the roots are actually visible along the glass. So to do this, uh, we took a subsample um, of, of eight rhizotrons and we completely washed and scanned the roots. And then you can, get, you can correlate the visible root length uh, with the total root length. And this luckily showed um, a nice correlation. So around four and a half of, to five percent of the total roots were actually visible along the glass. And Using this uh, regression line, we could estimate from the visible root length, we could estimate the total root length. Uh, and in this way, we could calculate the specific root length. So the specific root length is the length of the roots uh, per gram biomass. Um, and here we also see a pattern, um, which you would expect in a way, that the, con the control group had the lowest specific root length. So they kind of had, you could say, thicker roots. They didn't need to forage as much um, for the nutrients. On the other hand, you see a slight increase for the phosphorus-limited plants and the biggest increase for the nitrogen-limited plants. So the nitrogen-limited plants, uh, you could say they explore the a higher soil volume with a lower um, root biomass. 
then the, the last point I want to talk about <coughs> is um, the, the root biomass allocation throughout depth uh, by in the rhizotron. So what we did, we, we cut the rhizotron to open and we, we cut 10 centimeter layers to see, okay, where is most of the root biomass located? Uh, as you would expect um, with, with barley, that most of the roots are in the topsoil. But we do see a very clear pattern that the, the plants that received nitrogen late, they have less uh, root biomass in the topsoil, whereas uh, the control plants, but also the ones that receive phosphorus later, they, uh, yeah, they had a higher root biomass investment in the topsoil. In addition, we could see a slight increase for the, the plant that received nitrogen delayed. So after four weeks, we could see there's um, a slight increase in the 40 to 50 centimeter layer. So to wrap it all up, um, we have an overall major effect of nitrogen limitation, and we could see a small effect of P limitation as well. And the barley roots, they respond to low nitrogen initially by the similar root system. Uh, we see an increase in the root length. And then again, if they were still limited after four weeks, we could see an additional increase in visible root length compared to the plants that did receive nitrogen at that uh, point in time. We also saw a phosphorus limitation after two weeks, um, but we saw also a, a lower visible root length. And this could be because uh, response to phosphorus can also be mediated by other traits such as root hairs. Unfortunately, we couldn't measure the root hairs in the riser boxes in this setup. And the last point is that we didn't see a change in root to shoot ratio, which is surprising because we did see also a, a difference in root biomass allocation. This could possibly be because it's a crop plant, so it's really bred for um, above ground yield. This could also lower perhaps the plasticity in biomass allocation to the root system. So to conclude, back to the, to the farmer, the common agricultural knowledge is we can see that uh, how late <coughs> phosphorus arrives is important, but that's much more important to add nitrogen at the, at the right time. Even if you add it just a little bit later, you can see um, a decrease in biomass, which is not recoverable. Um, and what we add to this is we check the, the roots and we see a root adaptation in the, in the first time and an additional foraging response later, but this does not uh, make up for the biomass lost already. Then lastly, I'd like to thank my supervisor, Vicky Temperton, uh, Thomas Niemeyer for building the photo box and um, Hannah, Justin and Farida for helping washing a lot of roots. <laughs> All right, thank you for your attention. <laughs>